Greetings, friends of typography. I just finished another Blackletter Revival project and I figured, instead of just releasing the fonts, why not document the entire process? So in this video, I'm going to show you the finished design first and then I'm going to talk about the steps necessary to go from a letterpress font to a digital font. Enjoy! Once upon a time, there existed a typeface of extraordinary beauty and intrigue, carefully crafted by the skilled hands of a master type designer. The wondrous typeface was a sight to behold, with its majestic black letter design that bore the most exquisite swash letters, like delicate curls adorning the noble words it formed. As the sands of time trickled through the hourglass, the people moved on from the ornate beauty of black letter fonts. Over a hundred years drifted by, until one fateful day, an adventurous soul stumbled upon a hidden treasure. In a long-forgotten typecase, covered in a layer of dust, lay the slumbering letters of this typeface. With great care and curiosity, the letters were unearthed and brought back to life, now bearing a new name, Wunder. The design is now offered in two versions. The first version, meant for traditional German typesetting, holds true to the old ways, while the second version caters to the modern era, ensuring legibility for a wide or international audience. But the true enchantment of this design lies in its swash characters. When summoned, they respond as if by magic, gracefully embellishing the words they adorn. These swash characters choose to emerge only when their presence does not clash with their fellow letters. And for those of you who seek an even more enchanting spectacle, there exists a levitation feature, which causes the letters to automatically dance gracefully around the baseline. And thus, dear reader, this is the tale of Wunder, a typeface of the past reborn, ready to add a touch of enchantment and a sprinkle of magic to the world of type once more. The letterpress fonts I revive are usually from the early 20th century. For type designs from that time, it's usually not that hard to find printed type specimens. But there are a few problems. The first is that the type specimens rarely show the entire character set in a larger size. And this is intentional. The type foundries wanted their customers to see the design, but they didn't want their competitors to easily copy it and that's why the entire character set is usually not shown at all or only in a very small size. Another problem is the letterpress printing process itself. The smaller the type, the bigger the influence of the printing process on the outline of the letters. Have a look at this example. If the printed text looks like this, how do the letterpress letters look like that created this print? It really becomes guesswork. Where exactly are the character outlines? Is the roundedness part of the design or a result of the letterpress printing? And that's a rare ultra-high resolution scan. With a typical scan resolution, we probably see something like this. That's the reason I lean towards resurrecting letterpress designs using the original letterpress fonts that I can get my hands on. Not only does it allow me to inspect every detail, I don't even need a printed sample anymore. I can just directly scan the letters. Then I just clean up the scan, flip it and make sure everything is aligned properly. I also set a resolution which allows me to copy and paste between Photoshop and my font editor glyphs without the need for any scaling. With this Photoshop file, I can now easily select each letter and bring it into my font editor. And with a bitmap scan of the letter in the background, I can start creating a vector outline. I usually start with a rough sketch of the outline and then I zoom in and adjust the details until the vector outline matches the background image perfectly. All of that is done manually. On the internet, you can find plenty of free fonts based on older letterpress fonts that use auto-tracing to create the vector outlines. 
but this can never create an acceptable quality. Have a look at this comparison. On the left, you can see the result of auto-tracing, and on the right, you see the same letter manually drawn. By the way, it's also worth mentioning that there are some special requirements regarding the placement of nodes for PostScript fonts. We want to use as few nodes as possible, but we also need to have as much nodes as necessary to comply with the PostScript specifications. An endpoint should be placed at the most horizontal and most vertical extremes. This implies that most curves should not include more than 90 degrees of arc. The placement of extreme points aids the rendering algorithm in properly reproducing the major features of characters. As an example, a circle should not be created with just two points, even if that is easily possible. This design is missing two extreme points, but even four points aren't correct if they are not placed at the most horizontal and vertical extremes. This is the only acceptable placement for a postscript flavored design, and for a quality font, it's crucial to draw our entire character set with proper extreme points. And now I just continue to digitize the entire character set of the letterpress font. Uppercase, lowercase, figures, punctuation marks, ligatures, and so on. Around 100 characters in total. For letters with diacritical marks, we make use of an anchor system. We draw the diacritical marks separately and define corresponding anchor points within the base glyphs and the glyphs for the diacritical marks. The combined letters can then be created automatically and we can still make changes which are then properly synced across all letters using these components. After all letters were drawn, there will be many rounds of refinements, optimizing the design of individual glyphs and also looking at the consistency across the letters. Here is an example. The outlines of these two letters already look pretty good. No visible bumps or dents at all but the design still lacks consistency. Have a look at all these parts. If we imagine these letters being written with a broad nib pen, all those parts should have an equal stroke width and equal stroke endings. So let's fix that. Much better now. Unfortunately, a letterpress character set is insufficient for the modern needs. I always create my fonts with at least the complete Western Windows and Mac character sets. And with almost 250 characters, that is already a lot of work. Not all type foundries use this approach. Some designers leave out certain characters, just based on the assumption they won't be used anyway, like the math symbols or the outdated currency signs in the standard character sets but I rather go through the trouble of filling the entire standard character sets as a matter of principle. And for my black letter revival fonts, I always add character variations for all letters that use dedicated black letter letter skeletons that aren't compatible with Roman fonts, like the uppercase and lowercase y in this design. If I would ship this font with just the original letter designs, there would be very few use cases for my font. After all glyphs have been drawn, we still have to deal with the spacing, which we have ignored so far. At first, we carefully set the side bearings for each glyph, and we simplify this process by grouping all characters which share the same or a similar design on either the left or the right side. So, instead of setting a specific value for each glyph, we simply tell the Glyphs app to always use the value from a reference glyph. Take the letters N, M, and R. Notice how the left side is the same. So, we only assign spacing values specifically for the letter N, and both the letters R and M will use whatever is set for the left side of the letter N. Again, this is a process that goes through many rounds of refinements, where the font is tested over and over again with different texts to find potential problems. Even with the side bearings set perfectly for each letter, some combinations of glyphs might not create an acceptable spacing. This is solved through kerning pairs, spacing changes which apply only to specific letter pairs. Luckily, unlike Roman fonts, black letter fonts usually don't have that problem as they avoid diagonal strokes and work with negative space in a completely different manner. 
So, technically, most black letter fonts don't need kerning at all. I just added a few kerning pairs which deal with punctuation marks exclusively. Just as with the spacing, we can combine glyphs into groups so that similar designs all get the same kerning automatically. And finally, we take a look at the open type features. The swash characters are probably the most characteristic and most interesting feature of this typeface. But how are they being used with this font? We could just let users pick them manually, or we could set up an open type feature which replaces the base glyph with the swash glyph when the swash feature is turned on. This is how most open type features work. For example, replace the characters F and I with the FI ligature. But this wouldn't work well with these swash glyphs as they are only meant for the beginning and the end of lines of text. Unfortunately, there is no character or other marker to identify the end of lines within our open type code. So, we have to use an indirect method to make sure that our swash glyphs only appear at the end and beginning of lines or sentences. Let's start with lowercase swash glyphs for the end of the line. First, we create a class, which means a group of glyphs for our swash characters, and then another class for the glyphs that should be replaced by the swash glyphs. Then we create a swash feature, which says that each matching base glyph should be replaced with a corresponding swash glyph. Now our swash characters are working, but the result would look like this. We need to make sure the replacement only happens at the end of a line. We do that by creating a class containing all glyphs in our font. And then we set up a suppression rule for our swash feature, which kicks in whenever any character follows our base glyph. Or in other words, when we are not at the end of a line. And now our end swashes are working as expected. For our uppercase swash characters, we reverse the logic. The swash characters are used unless there is any character in front of the base glyph. But since these swashes reach pretty far into the word, we also have to check the two characters that follow the swash glyphs to avoid unwanted collisions, which would look really bad. So, I created two additional classes with glyphs that can and cannot follow the swash characters and created suppression rules with them. As a result, the swash characters will be used at the beginning of a line unless they are followed by glyphs that would cause a collision. In addition, I also added an interesting, somewhat experimental feature to let the characters move around the baseline in a seemingly random pattern. This is done by simply applying a movement based on the position of a glyph within a word. For each possible position, a different rule and baseline shift is set up. And that's how this black letter design was revived more than a century after its initial creation. For one year after the release of this video, my patrons can download the fonts exclusively and without an additional charge. After one year, licenses for the fonts will be available through my Foundry website.